Northern New York Community Podcast, stories from the heart of our community. Thanks again for joining us on the Northern New York Community Podcast. I'm your host, Max Del Signor. We're going to take you into the Adirondacks as part of this exploration into philanthropy with Lester Allen and Stephen Moyer. Les and Steve will share their affinity for the Adirondack region. We will discover how a community can stoke a passion for giving back through volunteerism and service. And also we will examine how philanthropy is vital to the North Country's future. Les and Steve, it's great to have you both here. Thanks for coming on the podcast. We're happy to be here, Max. Let's start in the Adirondack Park. It's a nice time of year to be up there, certainly as we record this. Um, after a two-year search for both of you, you found the perfect home in Wanakina in the early 1980s. Your individual experiences and history with the region dates back to before becoming seasonal residents, and you love the area. You've shared the natural beauty of those communities with others who eventually became hooked to the area, too. How would you describe the essence of the Adirondacks and especially Wanakina? Oh, wow, that's a, a good question. To me, it, it has a remarkable amount of wilderness and beauty that has little tourism. So for those that are attracted to that area, uh, it's just a lot of raw wilderness. And we were looking for that, and we didn't know that uh, having a community would become such an important part of what we enjoy about the area. Uh, it's a small community and it suffered major economic blows right uh, before we found the community in 1982 and it's been great to be part of and witness the spirit of this community create such a great place to live and, and take care of so many needs that there's little government help or infrastructure in place to handle. How did you both come to appreciate the North Country and all that it had to offer, maybe even outside of the natural beauty? Gosh, it it's just becomes a part of you. Uh, since I was uh, a small child, I'd spent time in the Adirondack Park, and it's hard to imagine not uh, having that part of my life. Uh, the natural beauty is remarkable. And uh, again, uh, what we didn't understand was so important, and I hadn't experienced growing up in a remote place in the Adirondacks, is what it's like to be part of this great little community. Now, Les, you grew up on a farm in Williamstown, New York, kind of on the eastern part of Oswego County? Correct. That's correct? Mm -hmm. Could you share a little bit just about your childhood and the interest you picked up on living in a rural community? No tourism. <laughs> so I enjoyed the woods, always played in the woods um, as a kid, built cottages, whether they be above ground, underground, whatever. <laughs> Gradually, as I got older, went to the city to go to school, got into boating, which of course took me away from the stream and the woods. And I guess some of the lakes were very crowded. I had to keep the boats at yacht clubs, this type of thing. So when we went looking for a rural place, we stumbled on Wanakina and it had all kinds of properties that needed help. And that was big incentive for me to save something. I love to salvage anything and everything. Where'd that interest come from, being able to rebuild and restore? I don't know. I think my grandparents did it, and then it skipped a generation with my parents, and then I went into it total. <laughs> Do you remember some of those? You'd mentioned building cottages when you were younger. Were there other projects that you can recall as, as a young boy that gave you great pride and joy because of something you put together? Well, there's been different properties in the city and so on that I tackled and uh, refurbished. It was always fun. It gives me something to do, but it doesn't have to be properties. It can be anything that's damaged or broken. I'll try to save it and put it back together. And Lester loves rehabilitation and recycling. He, he, um, he loves to save something that would otherwise be thrown away. <laughs> All of our pets were adopted. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't bred pets. <laughs> Quick follow-up question, Les, to what you said before. What drew you to, to the city? Uh, what was the, the thing that kind of said, this, this is the next stop or the next chapter in my life? I didn't go to college. I went to business school there in 1960, and my grandfather was on his uh, deathbed, and he wanted to know if I wanted the farm, 
and my mother was an only child and I'm an only child. And I was going away to school, so my mother took the farm and I took the woodlands, which I just sold last year to a finally to a developer. So I kept it all these years and paid the taxes, thinking maybe someday I'd want to go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just in case. Right. Can you share a little bit about your professional background too? I don't know what there is to say. I always liked real estate and I grew two companies or headed up large real estate firms all my life, taught real estate for 20, 30 years. And is that something that the career, is that just because of your interest in rehabilitation and the homes and being part of building a community and um, some of that early work kind of encouraged that path? Well, it's sort of, I started out at the nuclear sites and of course offered a promotion to go to Texas after Nine Mile and Fitzpatrick were finished. Didn't want to leave the area, being an only child, to take care of my parents. Always had a hobby of going through open houses. It's hard to find, a, uh, I think, a job when you don't have a four-year degree, making the kind of money I was at the nuclear sites. So I went into real estate and was salesman of the year the first year in the business and got pushed into management. And that was about it. I, I love looking at houses because uh, I'm not a lover of new construction. I love old houses and somebody else's nightmare and how to correct it and make it appealing for that new buyer. I've never really had to put a house on the market. You do some of these interesting features of whether it be old fireplace mantles, leaded windows, uh, adding features that most houses don't have and they sell. Well, it's a, it's a really great success story to have uh, the position of not going to college, but going to business school, the path you chose, and to be as successful as you were. Um, I know it's hard to kind of re maybe reflect and say it in this way, but what, what was the key to your success? What were the, you think, the key factors to saying, this is how I'm going to find success in real estate and be on this path of positive outcome? <laughs> well, I will, I will speak for Lester. He's very hardworking and he's determined. I saw from when we first met 45 years ago, he, he does care about other people. He brings people together. Being an only child, he enjoyed bringing people together. And he wouldn't necessarily have called it a building community, but he would love to see people come together, happily stay behind the scenes and just enjoy making connections and having people come together and have a good time. Steve, to go back to what you mentioned before about your summers as a child, Racket Lake, the Adirondacks, that was kind of your first exposure, a glimpse to the North Country. Um, can you share a memory or two about those seasonal memories and being up at Racket Lake and what it was like to kind of begin to get acclimated to North Country? Yeah, uh, we had a, a, a little cottage six miles by boat in a remote part of the lake and I would spend summers as a little boy up there with just a few other families around. So I spent days uh, boating, canoeing, hiking, and just uh, finding it delightful to be out in, in the woods. Did you know that as you got older that Wanakina and the Adirondacks was a place you wanted to live later on in life? We both knew that the Adirondacks held such a, a great beauty and enjoyment for us that we spent two years looking to replicate what was familiar to me and to Lester, a remote little cottage uh, at the time. It didn't matter if it was uh, remote uh, with no road access and no utilities. It was what I grew up with. Uh, we would have tired of that very quickly had we found it. You don't necessarily think ahead. So ironically, it took year, two years of frustration of not finding anything that was either quite right or affordable before we were open to something as different from what we thought we wanted as the house in Wanakina turned out to be. We were so exhausted and ready to give up that we finally threw our hands up and said, this is not at all what we were imagining wanting, but we thought, well, what's the harm? We'll do it. And ironically, it was the perfect place. We can't imagine now how different and unfulfilling any other experience would have been and how quickly we would have tired of the travel by boat and lack of utilities. It, it immediately became clear in a big house in a small community how easy it was to bring people together and become part of a community and make uh, the joy of being part of a community 
part of the joy of being in the North Country, to have both the remote wilderness right in your back door and yet the joy of, of being part of a community and being able in a big house to bring family and friends together, which would have been much more challenging to just be off by yourself in a remote part <laughs> right. of the Adirondacks. <laughs> your career, also in real estate, which is interesting, how, how did that profession kind of grab you? Completely from a different angle uh, from Lester's. Lester loves houses and loves uh, renovating homes. So it was all about the house for Lester and the, uh, his drive to succeed and accomplish things. For me, I'm quite the extrovert and prior to choosing to work in real estate, I had done finance accounting work, which I was capable of, but it so little fulfilled me that I did a lot of volunteer work in the human service not-for-profit area and found meaning in doing work with and for others. And when I decided to find something at the age of 39 more meaningful than crunching numbers, no offense to people who choose <laughs> accounting as a career, uh, for me it wasn't fulfilling. And it dawned on me after a year of frustration not finding quite the right fit in the human service not-for-profit community uh, as an employer, it occurred to me that real estate was the perfect opportunity for me to bring all of my previous life experiences, aptitudes and interests, uh, an accounting, finance, tax background. With uh, Lester, we had renovated quite a few homes. My dad was an engineer. I knew my way around how homes and house projects and maintenance items, and I had volunteered for years at a crisis line. I understood reflecting emotions and the process of helping people make a wise decision was to me all about real estate, not about selling a product. It was about helping people make wise decisions. And because it's totally client-based and relationship-based, the way I do real estate, sure enough, each year, because of repeat business and personal referrals, my, my practice grows with no self-promotion. And so I feel gratified regularly that I'm helping people achieve something important in their lives. I don't feel, I don't think of myself as a successful salesperson. I think of myself as a successful facilitator and relationship manager. Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite the, the talent uh, that you do have to craft over time. It's not something, some folks I think have the ability or the, um, you know, it's part of their skill set, but it's a good craft to be a relationship builder in, in any profession. Um, somebody who's very talented at that can certainly, it's a, it's a key to success. Oh, exactly. Yeah. I always say he doesn't sell houses, he makes friends. Mm. <laughs> well, he's made some, some really good friends in, in the Wanakina area and in the Adirondacks, certainly. To go back to those early years, so you, you buy the home in 1982, you begin to see the community around you. Um, first question, actually, Les, will be for you. As you begin to see the homes and start to think about, okay, which one of these can I begin to rehabilitate or bring back to help revitalize where we live? What were some, what was the early process or thoughts about it? Did you know which house you wanted to start with or were there some friendships you had to make first before you could start to kind of attack a home? Well, it was, I think, difficult in the beginning because due to the mines, the mills, going out of business, there was so much disrepair and the people wanted to keep their town their town. They didn't want outsiders. Lester sensed a resistance to change and being new to the town, right. Lester felt, correctly or incorrectly, I think at times he perceived some strong personalities as adding up to resistance for someone coming in from outside and uh, buying up houses. So he, d he didn't so, rush to do this. <laughs> yeah, I took time and had various discussions with local people that if something was on the market a year and hadn't sold, that it would be fair game for me to buy. And once I started repairing the houses and making them look better, it was amazing to watch the self-pride of the individuals start picking and fixing their places up, and which is what helps every area is when you have a community that's participating together. And Wanakina is so small, right. it's rare that one individual would have an opportunity to, by only renovating four or five homes, make such a major 
shift in the feel of the whole town. Most communities are so big that uh, it would take a major effort <laughs> right. to change the feel of the whole town. What was your reaction, Steve, to just watching Les's passion on display as he began to go into each of these homes, bring them back to life, and see the community really progress? Well, I think like so many things in life, only after the fact, in retrospect, do you fully appreciate what was going on. When we were doing it, we were just following our passions. I am such an extrovert, and when I see people that I think might enjoy the Adirondacks, I just invite them to come and experience it. That was the pleasure of having a seven-bedroom house, is being able to bring people together. And Lester just loved uh, bringing something back, brought him joy, seeing these great old homes that were left and forlorn. Uh, it was just in his DNA to want to bring them back to life. And so uh, together, we would, uh, I would connect with people and bring, bring them all to the area. Then Lester would share his enthusiasm for both the location and the houses. And before they knew what was happening, they fell in love with the town. And, and uh, one by one, friends and people we knew would come, fall in love with the place, and buy cottages there. And I thought at the time it would make a great retirement for me because I would do the financing, hold the mortgages myself. Mm -hmm. A miraculous thing came along called creative financing. So everybody refied, and now I'm sitting here broke. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but you have many. You're, but you're rich in friends. <laughs> many good friends that you yes, along the way. Yes, he absolutely um, always has a full house, and and that I think was one of the key things growing up, being an only child and no family. I had bought my first cottage and had parties there, and therefore there was people around. So I've always been, I like to be behind the scenes. I'm not out on the porches or whatever with crowds of people. I'd rather be in the kitchen and seeing people enjoy themselves. And there was at least one or two people last, right, that were integral in some of the rehabilitation with you in Wanakina, correct? Could you mention a couple of those, those folks who kind of helped with some of the projects that you worked on with those homes? Oh, there was a gentleman that lived there with his wife and worked in the city as a finished carpenter. And so he pretty much, I'd give him a list of everything I wanted done to each house. And fantastic gentleman, and he'd do it during the winter while I was gone and never had a question or varied on price, even a dollar. And so that made it a lot easier for me to know that I had someone that was so capable. Yes, looking back, it's remarkable all of the pieces that came together quite remarkably. Chuck Cassidy, this uh, delightful person with so much talent, uh, he loved Lester's creativity. He loved a challenge. So these board-on-board -board, uh, cottages, some of the smaller cottages that were for all the workmen there in the day of the lumbering, it took a special carpenter to understand how to make some of these things work and to work with all of the architectural uh, elements that Lester had over the years of following the wrecking business in Syracuse and salvaging interesting newel posts, banisters, stained glass windows, Lester's parents' barn was full of all these things Lester had salvaged and he found in each home places to enhance the character of these homes and Chuck loved and had the talent to make it all come together. As a, uh, so each cottage was enhanced with a lot of architectural detail that was consistent with the period the cottage was built, but maybe not the decoration that, that when it was built as a workman's house it might have had. So, so it was fun for Lester to incorporate all the things he'd salvaged all these years into the cottages and make them even more interesting than they were. And Chuck was the perfect person to do that. Had he not been there in town, to find someone uh, with his experience and talent would have been a, a tall order. And Lester, as talented as he is, he wouldn't have been able to do some of those projects on his Great own. Great at tearing apart, but I can't put it back together. <laughs> I'd have another uh, kind of partner in crime with you to kind of build those along. Oh, the two of them just have the best time. They, uh, love, they It was Chuck's passion to do the work and do it as creatively. The more creative and challenging the project, the more he enjoyed it. So he did some amazing things, and uh, for the 15 or 20 year run they worked together, it was uh, a, a huge shock and disappointment when barely into his late 50s, I think, he passed unexpectedly, and that was the end of Lester's. By then the whole town was off and going, 
But and each individual that purchased a home, I think in their own way, reached out and become an integrate part of the community, whether they started the historical societies, the tours. Remarkably, what Lester's saying is that this tiny little town that needs so many, the talents of virtually everyone, most of us that live in bigger cities just give up the roles of all of the caretakers of the services to government and agencies. We just live our life and assume everything is going to be done. The water is going to come on when you turn it on. The sewer is going to go away and <laughs> be gone. The trash will be picked up and you just call a contractor when something needs to be done. One of the people that came in uh, ended up running the store, you know, that bought one of the first houses from me. Uh, running the store and then the general store. Well, it's been a tr almost everyone that has come has found some way to contribute, whether it's playing the organ in the church or starting up the historical association or uh, the volunteers that are there that we saw come to town after we got there that now volunteer to monitor the water system and the sewer system and keep the village green mode and, and, and do uh, the people that organize events. Uh, we have uh, a cultural committee that brings in concerts uh, in the green all summer long. Uh, and it's hard to think of anyone who doesn't love the wilderness but also totally gets and participates in helping the community be the community. We really sit back now and are just, just marvel. Lester's knack was uh, behind the scenes rehabilitation and the town is beautifully rehabilitated now. And now people that want to actively be involved in preserving the history or making the quality of life better are all doing their thing. And it's just phenomenal to I watch that. Dave Zamba, right? Dave Zamba. Zamba, he's come on, he took over the store, but then he got involved with the water systems and the things that are going on in the square. And he, he had a career with, tremendously Weg vital. with Wegmans in uh, Buffalo. He, he and his family just had a, an epiphany one moment 30 years ago where they did not want their children to grow up in Buffalo uh, and they wanted to come back to Wanakina where Dave had attended the ranger school. And this is not uncommon. Uh, that ranger school experience uh, proves to be uh, uh, very powerful and important to so many people that many, many folks uh, are coming back to Wanakina that had that ranger school experience and Dave was one of them. He and his wife came, they raised their children there. He ran the general store and he now is a, a huge volunteer keeping all the infrastructure going and driving the school bus <laughs> and the wife is a nurse in the Clifton uh, Fine Hospital. Well it's unique to see all these different forms of philanthropy kind of come in confluence together to make Wanakina what it is today, you know, the community that it is. You know, if, it, if it's Dave or Chuck Cassidy or the two of you, to see those contributions being made over time to add up to what is the community today and everything that's happening is really, you know, pretty special. It makes each community unique. Uh, to go back, Steve, to your experience with volunteerism and serving on boards and committees, um, you served on a variety of those, primarily in central New York, from the Onondaga Historical Association to Arise, you said, though, just a few minutes ago, that one of the most powerful experiences has been a volunteer for the local crisis line, which mm -hmm. you've done for over 20 years. In that kind of role as a volunteer, what did you learn the most about the needs of the community, that specifically, but also what did you learn about yourself going through that experience? Wow. As far as the community needs, there's so much attention to brick and mortar and meeting the basic clothing and uh, shelter needs. Those are two major focuses of many uh, human service endeavors. Um, the counseling and crisis line really helps people who are in a crisis, uh, sometimes financial, but more often emotional crisis. And that was a dimension that I didn't fully come to appreciate. And I learned both about the individual needs of, of humans, and it, I, I grew in my capacity to understand mental health issues and uh, people who were suffering for personal reasons. But, uh, but I also came to learn it was a personal growth experience because prior to my time volunteering with a crisis line, I thought sharing my joy germs and my cheerful personality was the best way to help people. And I had no sense of going in my head to where they were. So the personal growth for me was understanding that I had to just shut down my own mind and my own expectations and I had to leave the sunny side of the street and walk with other people 
on the dark side of the street, if they were experiencing dark times, I had to reflect and understand and show an appreciation and understanding of what they were going through. And I think that serves well in all human relationships. It certainly serves well in understanding the emotional mindset uh, that is pretty intense with my clients. Uh, more than half of my clients, it's not a happy time. First time home buyers, it's joyful, but death, divorce, and unwelcome corporate moves or loss of job issues, those are very challenging times for clients. And in a community, in any human relationship, taking time to shut down your own thoughts and expectations and focus on what's going on with another person uh, is a powerful way to engage with that person and be there for them. In a world where many people feel this fast-paced, electronically connected world, I think it's very common that people feel like they're disconnected and that no one really gets what's going on in their mind. Did that experience either influence or impact your philanthropy or how you gave back at all over all the years? I think all of these together just enriched my understanding of the um, diversity and needs of people and the importance of, of growing and transcending beyond your own world experience and experiencing the world of others and the joy that gives you to, to uh, step outside your own comfort zone, to step outside your own world and understand the, the needs and challenges of other people. Uh, it's a very powerful thing to do and it's a very gratifying thing to do to find ways to be there for other people. Question for each of you. And you've answered this a little bit, I think, through your, your personal experiences that you've shared on this interview, but overall, what compels you to give? Be it a financial gift, be it your talent, time to somebody else, volunteering for a nonprofit, what would it be? Well, there are so many answers to that question. Some of them, uh, cynically and simply, uh, the tax code makes it financially wise to give. And some people, for some people, that's enough. It's just... Uh, the idea for some people it's important to leave a legacy to they realize that giving is a good way to uh, leave a permanent impact that may not be there uh, just in the normal pursuits of day-to-day -day life but to me the key is the enrichment of your own life and I it came uh, to me many years ago that uh, when you seek happiness for yourself it's often elusive when you seek enrichment or happiness for others, you do tend to find it yourself. Lester, what compels you to give? I think I would go a different route in that being in a management position most of my life and trying to encourage people to give them incentive. I like contests. When you see someone else do something and ask that they match you, or whatever, it creates, oh, I can do that. It's surprising how fast a community will come together, whether it's helping a church fund or whatever the cause may be, if you have someone step forward and make a generous donation, if they can match it, the community. I did it in sales for so many years to encourage salesmen to reach for just one more listing or sale and I think some people sit back always expecting whether it be the community the government or whatever to take care of everything I think we as individuals need to you know step forth and help in a situation and the best way is to have someone you know take the lead if you want to put it that way it's worked for me in the community Lester is a person who likes to help behind the scenes and help other people be their best. He likes to see them improve their lot in life and he likes to see them step forth and, and be helpful too. And I've had the pleasure over the years of watching Lester be amazingly mindful of people around him in situations and find quiet ways to help out behind the scenes and help people find their better nature and gently with humor find ways uh, to help people from going down dark paths or do disrespectful things and to encourage them to contribute and to, to be better, to kind of be the band leader and encourage everyone to get on board and move, move in a positive direction. Such as 
the community foundation that we're part of here today, when I wanted to establish a foundation, I was asked, you know, what do you want your funds or whatever to do? And I said, I'd rather leave that up to you because in this area, whatever you know the areas that best need, where I wouldn't. And in turn, if it's something that's coming in to help all different causes, it works better than just picking one. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Mm -hmm. Well, it, in that same kind of thread, one endeavor you felt was important to support was the establishment of the Clifton Fine Community Fund, which kind of had that broad, far-reaching impact and potential to do so in perpetuity, and that fund being at the Northern New York Community Foundation. Why was establishing another fund devoted to the geographic region important to you both? Because you decided after, I think, that effort and supporting that to create a fund that would help Wanakina long term. What, what was the catalyst for that? Right. Well, we were impressed by the Northern uh, New York Community Foundation and Randy, the executive director, was great at helping us be aware of what was being done. and giving us more insight than what we already had as to a lot of poverty issues and uh, the huge amount of need and uh, troubles in the area. And we knew there was a fund already in the area, but we were in a place where we were able to and, and chose to do one that brought a sharper focus to put the needs for Wanakina. Obviously, that was our little community. We felt warmly toward the entire Clifton Fine area but we wanted one that uh, would support the entire area, but also give a gentle preference toward the needs that were right there in Wanakina. That being, for 35 years now, uh, so much a part of our lives. Given what you've seen in you know, over 30 years, and Wanakina is really its transformation to what it is now, how important is the future of that community, Clifton Fine region, and even we'll say the North Country on the grander scale, how important is the region's future in terms of its philanthropy? What kind of role can philanthropy play to these next generations of these communities? Well, it's hard to even begin to imagine what needs will be there in future generations, but uh, two things are clear to me. The community foundation concept is a very powerful and efficient way to meet current and future needs. We, we would be foolish to think we could understand what the needs 50 and 100 years from now will be. There certainly will be needs and the Community Foundation will be there to meet them, I'm sure. In so many dimensions, whether you look at what scientists imagine climate change to bestow, and clearly the Adirondacks are going to be a great geographic place uh, as coastline areas and farmlands across the uh, the world are going to be challenged with change in climate, the Adirondacks will always have a natural beauty that scientists, based on what I read, is not likely to be as jeopardized as other areas. So I, it's possible to think that suddenly the Adirondacks may be a much more desirable place to live than, than places that are currently uh, thought of as the place to live. But the dynamics of decades of loss of industry throughout the Northeast and specifically the challenges to the Adirondack region, um, it's hard to imagine a time where there won't be uh, a challenge to try to live in the confines of a park where industry and growth are challenged by the need to balance the, the needs of the, of the nature and the park. So I think the Community Foundation will always find ways to help those that are living within the, the park and with, throughout the North Country. For someone who hasn't demonstrated or hasn't quite yet participated in philanthropy in their own way, what would you say to someone who's thinking about volunteering for the first time, making their first gift to a cause or an effort, what would, would your message be to that person that is kind of on the precipice of starting their philanthropy but has been hesitant maybe to do so? Well, I think from the perspective of uh, people who uh, would be in a position to appreciate that help, they would um, understandably help that individual find ways to help in, in a way that brings meaning or connects with what is important to their life. The part that I would add on 
to the process of finding what's meaningful or what, whether it's education or environment or uh, helping individuals, whatever brings meaning to that individual is considering it. But the part that some people, I don't think, stop to realize is um, how, how good it feels, how important contributing to the lives of others enhances your own life. And I, I don't know as though that is always spoken of or acknowledged or fully understood, but I, I would like to think that most people come to understand that helping others enriches your own life. And, um, and that's an important message that would be one I would, would always welcome people to be mindful of as they're considering ways to help other people or to, to either a contribution of their time, their, their uh, as we used to say in the not-for-profit area, wealth, uh, wisdom, and work, mm -hmm. <laughs> some combination of those three gifts that people are able to make. Lester, what has the journey been like in going through a lot of these philanthropic endeavors, doing it together with Steve, being able to give back, support a community, help so many causes the way that you, you have in doing so together? I'm the one, the quiet one behind the scenes, so I find all these questions difficult, <laughs> and I'm not as eloquent at versing as he is, so I find myself the Community Foundation, when I first, we first started our portion of it, whatever, there was people that had come to the house and asking for help on a particular issue, and all of a sudden there was another uh, issue that came forth that was being taken care of by the foundation and the other people had asked and I felt terrible so I took care of both and I feel the foundation is beneficial in that they know the best usage in a given community where I would only know an individual or a particular cause. It's hard to be fair if you're picking individually so I think that's why uh, another foundation was established or whatever in making donations to the hospitals or this or that. Personally, behind the scenes for years, I've always uh, tried to help people. And it's difficult because if one person hears that so-and-so, well, they just did this, then, well, why not me? So I think the Community Foundation is playing a vital role in helping an area. Well, so I, well, that's about to, the way I would put it. Yeah, the, the process through the Community Foundation of assessing uh, community leaders and the foundation assess, uh, assess various applications for the money and are best in a best position to find the best use of the funds. So it takes the onus off you to say yes or no individually to a project. <laughs> To, to wrap up, and I'm going to finish with a question I had for you, Steve, but I want to hear what Les's response oh, on this one is, too. I, I promise it's an easy one. Thinking of this younger generation, the standard that I feel you and others that have been part of this project or others in the community who have demonstrated philanthropy, it's a very high standard, but it's been a good one I think younger folks should reach for or attain or hope to reach for. What would you say, Les, to the younger generation to help inspire them or get them to think about philanthropy and giving back to their community and why it's, why it's so important? I'd rather you answer first. <laughs> <laughs> we can think about that. Well, I think that young people at some point will come to appreciate the needs that are out there and will find ways to meaningfully help other people and, and find meaning in helping. And I guess young people know different than all people uh, that part of, of growing where you realize, irrespective of the means you have, uh, that there are so many ways to give and contribute to other people. And uh, even if you don't have large sums of money, the Community Foundation is a great conduit through which to do that. But I would encourage anyone to find any opportunity to volunteer or to find something meaningful where you can enrich the lives of others and thereby find more meaning in your own life? I really don't know how to answer. I think you see individuals that like to work. If you have that ethic 
from childhood of wanting to work and improve yourself, organizations, whatever, can look for these individuals and that in turn makes the organization develop faster because you have people that really want to succeed and work. There are so many people today that are used to some form of program being given and therefore their attitude is that I should always be taken care of. You've got to have that feeling from within that nothing comes free. You've got to work for it. And that is the same with an organization, I think. You have to work and grow and develop, and that's why we're here today, is that I'm trying to help, and you are too. You, you're an industrious person. You appreciate when people work hard at things. And in the end, uh, there's the added benefit when you not, not only work hard for your own benefit, but working hard to benefit many others uh, can be even further enriching than just working hard for your own benefit. And I think perhaps that would be you coming from a place where you like to improve things, you like to take things that are in decline or that serve no purpose any longer and repurpose them, rehabilitate them. And I think for young people, you would be happy to help show them how you do it, help them encourage. Uh, I think I come from the background that a lot of people probably still do here in the area is we had to grow everything we ate. I never got to a store until I was probably 16, 18. And you only had what you could make for yourself. We, being self-sufficient and working hard and protecting your, yourself in the future, but I think you not only want to see other people work hard and improve themselves, but, uh, but do something meaningful as you have had the opportunity to do to make a major difference in an entire community. And I, I think you found a lot of gratification in that. And I think you would welcome other people to find ways to do things that can make a difference, not just for themselves, but for others. Doesn't he say it well? You both say it very well. <laughs> <laughs> what well, your experiences in uh, perspectives I think are really good lessons to take away for those that have a chance to listen to the interview and have had a chance to kind of go through this journey of hearing how your philanthropy started, how you make a community great, and how important it is for philanthropy to be here and present in the future. Thank you for sharing those perspectives and that feedback. Uh, we appreciate your time here on the podcast and many thanks for your years of generosity to the Adirondack region and to northern New York. It's been truly a joy to have you here to share your story. Well, it's been a joy, and it's wonderful to think that others might be inspired to find ways to add meaning to their life through helping others. That wraps up another Northern New York Community Podcast. Remember, every interview is easily accessible and always free, whether it's online or on your mobile device. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or other podcast platforms when you search for the Northern New York Community Podcast. Check out our podcast website, which also features interview highlights, transcripts, photo galleries, and much more. Just go to www.nnycpodcast.com. Thanks to our supporters, WPBS and the Northern New York Community Foundation for making this podcast possible. And thanks again to you for listening. We'll hope you join us next time for another edition of the Northern New York Community Podcast. Northern New York Community Podcast, stories from the heart of our community.